Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tank. My name is Alan. In between A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back, three full years of non-stop fighting occurs between the Rebel Alliance and the Galactic Empire. And it's actually a really fascinating time, and it's unfortunately one of those periods of time that just isn't really covered by any of the TV shows or movies, which I think is a huge mistake. It was during this time the Rebels launched the Mid-Rim Offensive, which quickly got bogged down and was renamed the Mid-Rim Retreat, which is not a good sign. The Rebs, spurred on by their victory at Yavin 4 and a flood of new recruits, took the fight to the Empire and assaulted the Mid-Rim on various fronts. The initial ferocity of the offensive forced the Empire to withdraw from several worlds. After all, this wasn't a military designed to fight a determined conventional enemy. It was designed for oppression of the civilian populace. Now, a lot of Imperial occupied worlds, you already had rebel cells existing, you know, local dissidents. And so when the rebel lines initially started their mid-rim offensive, they were met with a lot of local support. But eventually this offensive ran out of steam. You also had a lack of coordination at the sector level. You had some pretty major defeats and wipeouts of entire rebel units, and that caused things to really change. More importantly, the Alliance fleet just wasn't capable of protecting the advance of Rebel ground forces, especially their increasingly extended and vulnerable supply lines. By the third year of the offensive, the Rebel logistical system was on the verge of collapse. Now, it should be mentioned that these scrappy Rebels came from nothing and were used to fighting with nothing. I mean, many Rebel infantry units were actually self-contained and self-sustained. Organized at the company level, these units were based usually on a ship of some type, a freighter or a corvette, typically a civilian vessel that is up armed armored and up armed. These vessels would serve as basically the military base, living quarters, training center, also their transportation, and occasionally uh, air support. If you're lucky, the Rebel Navy might attach a gunship or you know a few A-wings to escort your unit, but that was usually it. That was all the support you were going to get from the Rebel Alliance, especially towards the end of the Midrim Retreat, when things were getting completely chaotic. It was a very difficult time to be a Rebel infantry fighter. There was no rotation off the front line. There were no replacement fighters. I mean, usually Rebel infantry units would hold open recruitment calls in cities they just recently liberated. And of course, that is extremely sketchy because you have individuals who are desperate for food, who are just looking for handouts. You have um, other individuals who might be uh, former Imperial deserters or even saboteurs. You also have criminal elements that might be looking to get hold of weapons. So you have to be very careful at going through all these people and selecting the right ones, which of course was very difficult to do for a combat unit, which is not trained to do these kind of things. This is the reality of the Rebel infantry during this period of time, and it's not surprising that many units just got destroyed or faded away. There was really no support, no larger structure backing all of these units. The Rebel High Command had made an amateur mistake. They were focused on taking territory, defeating Imperial forces without any real way to sustain their operation. Everything really starts with logistics on the battlefield. And I is one of the most important lessons that you can learn from Star Wars. Now, during the Mid-Rim Retreat, the famed Rebel Infantry unit known as the 61st Mobile Infantry, aka Twilight Company, attacked the planet of Hyderal Prime and stumbled upon a brilliant prize, Governor Every Chalice. Former emissary to the Imperial Ruling Council, she had been a part of a series of purges carried out by Emperor Palpatine after the loss of the Death Star. He was basically trying to find people to blame. It was a dumb and vindictive move, you know, classic Palpatine. You see, Every Chalice was actually a genius, and she had an encyclopedic memory of basically the Imperial military's logistical network. Everything from fuel caches, transportation routes, the patrols on said routes, Imperial manufacturing hubs and supply depots, even uh, weapons development centers and research bases. And she leveraged the hell out of that knowledge when she defected to the rebels, you know, because she didn't feel like she was being treated that well. And also, Emperor Palpatine put her in a really exposed place where she could easily be captured. And she couldn't have come at a better time for the rebellion. The Midrim retreat would lead the rebellion straight to the disastrous defeat they suffered at Hoth, where the entire rebel command is almost captured. You see, the rebels were finally challenging the Empire in conventional battles out in the open, something that the Empire is arguably better suited for. Despite how terrifyingly inefficient the design of their ships were, an Imperial Star Destroyer was still a city-sized hunk of Duracrete bristling with turbolasers, and aside from a few trickmen maneuvers, you know, like the famous Lightmaker maneuver at Scarif that destroyed two Star Destroyers, it was still quite rare for the Rebels to win the day when the Empire had an Imperial-class Star Destroyer in their fleet. And no matter how well the Rebel infantry fought on the ground, they could never really hold the planet as long as Imperial-class Star Destroyers hovered above in the sky. 
where the rally I needed was a solid way to counter the Imperial class Star Destroyer, not just tricks and crazy tactics, but a real vulnerability that could be consistently exploited. Which is where Governor Every Chalice comes into play. Here's a quote that I oftentimes attribute to her. Star Destroyers may be nearly indestructible, but they're the most resource-intensive ships this galaxy has ever seen. Armed with intimate knowledge of all of the Imperial logistical nodes in the region, Every Chalice started guiding Twilight Company to strike at the weak underbelly of the Empire. Why fight a prize fighter in the ring where you know you can't beat them when you can, I don't know, slowly poison their food supply and training camp? I mean, that is essentially what the Rebels started doing, leveling the playing field by targeting Imperial supplies and logistics. The Rebellion could fight with poor logistics and shoddy equipment. They've always been desperate and made up of ruffians, desperados, hardy folk from the Outer Rim who were already living pretty minimalistic lives. But the Empire and its soldiers, they were trained to fight with excess, with massive amounts of equipment, supplies, and support. Taking that away was one of the most important strategic goals for the Rebel Alliance. Take the Imperial Class Star Destroyer, for instance, a 1.6 kilometer or one mile long battleship with a height of around 455 meters, around the same height as the uh, CN Tower in Toronto. It also has a crew and onboard contingent that was roughly around 50 to 60,000 Imperials. It's hard to describe this thing as anything else but a small floating city. Now, there's actually a city right across the river from New York City called Hoboken. It's also known as Mile Square City because of its size, which is actually kind of similar to a Star Destroyer, and it's a packed urban environment with mostly brownstones and a nice boardwalk. And get this, it has a population of 59,000 people. So, this is a city that is very similar in size and population to a Star Destroyer. And what makes the city very interesting is that it's kind of cordoned off from its neighbors. There's very few ways to actually drive into Hoboken. To the west of the city, you have the Palisade Cliffs, where Jersey City Heights are located. There's only like a few paths down from the hills to get to Hoboken. And then to the south, we have Hoboken Train Station, a major hub for uh, NJ Transit that kind of blocks everything off as well. And then to the north, you have like the Lincoln Tunnel separating the city from Weehawken. And so what we have is a densely populated city with a few narrow choke points, maybe less than 10 roads that lead into the city, which means driving to Hoboken is a pain in the ass. There's generally massive lines going to the city during rush hour, and you're also seeing all of the box trucks that actually supply the city. That is the logistical network for Hoboken Star Destroyer. Now, the logistics of Hoboken are complicated, but luckily Hoboken isn't a Star Destroyer, really. It's a city that is tethered to a larger network of roads and rails that are connected to other parts of the supply chain. Actually, one of the biggest ports in the Northeast, uh, in Newark and Elizabeth, is just a few miles away. Now, Star Destroyer has similar needs to a city like Hoboken because there's a similar population. So you're talking about similar amounts of water and food. The only problem is the Star Destroyer can't resupply constantly. It's not tethered to anything. It's a mobile battleship, which means it needs to carry enough provisions in between refueling and refitting. And according to Imperial Doctrine, an ISD has about two years worth of consumption on board. So that's a lot of stuff you need to carry. So how much does Hoboken or an Imperial class Star Destroyer consume in two years? Well, in a single day, the average person should consume about 0.5 to one gallon of water per day, and they use around 80 to 100 gallons of water per day for drinking, cooking, bathing, and uh, you know, toilet stuff. Let's say an Imperial soldier consumes the same amount of drinking water, but we can cut down on the other water consumption by half because of rationing and military discipline. You know, no bubble baths, no hosing down your TIE fighter when it's completely unnecessary. So that's maybe about 40 gallons a day, let's say. Uh, times that by 50,000 individuals, and you have 2 million gallons of water a day. That's how much water is used on an Imperial class Star Destroyer. So that's about three Olympic swimming pools worth of water, which is definitely feasible because an Imperial class Star Destroyer is massive internally, and I'm sure they're also recycling the water. Remember, an ISD is powered by a small star on board, which means a distillation of dirty liquids and sewage is definitely gonna be feasible from an energy usage point of view. Then what about the food? Well, that's a little more tricky. The average person consumes around five pounds a day. So that's around 250,000 pounds of food a day being consumed on an Imperial class Star Destroyer. Destroyer. Most of this food comes in the form of highly processed like protein squares, nutrition paste, and other weird like stuff that is designed to have a long shelf life so you can store it on the ship for two years. And so 250,000 pounds of food a day times two years, that's about 91,250 tons worth of food. That's about the weight of a Nimitz class aircraft carrier. Interesting enough, the cargo capacity on an ISD, at least in Legends, is only 40,000 tons, so less than half of what you would need to carry all the food uh, you would need to feed everyone. So 
you know, maybe the food is kept out of the cargo equation or something like that. Or maybe the food is just a lot lighter because in Star Wars they figured it out, you know. But anyway, let's just think about that. 250,000 pounds of food. How much would it take for an Imperial Logistical Center to ferry all of that food into an Imperial Class Star Destroyer? Well, let's say in the Star Wars universe they have, uh, they use pallets for delivering goods. They definitely already have OSHA, so that seems to make sense. And so let's say one pallet has about 2,000 pounds or a ton of food on it. So you have 125 pallets in your factory that needs to be flown up to the Imperial Class Star Destroyer because most ports and facilities in the NRM are not going to have facilities to accommodate a one mile long ship docking to it. And so you're going to probably be using a Lambda Class shuttle, which honestly are never used for their intended purpose as a luxury VIP shuttle. Or better yet, if you're at a bigger supply depot, maybe they have a few Zeta Class heavy cargo shuttles, which is a detachable ventral cargo pod that is specifically designed for this type of operation. Judging by the length of the Zeta class, which is around 35 meters, I'm guessing you could fit maybe like 50 to 75 pallets into the vessel at one time. I don't know what the uh, safe operational takeoff weight is for one of these things, uh, but basically it takes two trips for a Zeta class heavy cargo shuttle to offload one day's worth of food on the shuttle. Let's say you have to load these things up with droids or manually with those, uh, you know, repulsor carts. And let's say it takes 25 minutes to load and unload. That's about 50 minutes just for one trip. I mean, you could actually also have cargo pods, which are preloaded, which you can just switch on to the Zeta. And that will save a considerable amount of time. So let's say it takes five minutes to switch out pods for new pods full of stuff, but you still are going to spend 25 minutes offloading all of those pallets onto the ship. So 30 minutes for one load, that means an hour for two loads. And so it means it takes one shuttle an hour to load on a day's worth of food onto an Imperial class Star Destroyer. And judging by how big the hangars are, you can't really do more than maybe six of these cargo ships at a time. You can possibly use auxiliary hangars on the sides of the ship, uh, of course. So let's push that number to maybe 10 cargo ships at a time, offloading goods onto an Imperial class Star Destroyer. So that means in one hour, you can load up to 10 days worth of food onto an Imperial class Star Destroyer. So it takes about 36 and a half hours to load a year's worth of food onto a Star Destroyer. And that's just one year of food. You need two years of food, and then you also need ammunition, you know, proton torpedoes, blaster packs, fuel for the reactor, Tabana gas for the turbo lasers. And what about extra armor, you know, helmets, uniforms? What about sanitary products, basic tools and equipment, Ewok jerky for morale? And of course, spare parts and all the things you need to maintain the ship and the wing of TIE fighters on board, all of the ATATs. Basically, what I'm getting at is an Imperial class Star Destroyer cannot be properly uh, resupplied by ferrying goods up to the ship. I mean, it would take just weeks to, to do this. Now, you could definitely do a short resupply just to, you know, fill out some necessities that you're low on, but eventually an ISD is going to need to go to a specialized facility for a full resupply and a refit. Ideally, you're going to find an orbital dock large enough where you can directly walk on or push supplies onto the ship. That would increase the speed of rearming and resupplying significantly. I should actually mention that inside the ship you have a tram system and you also have, you know, special corridors and levels just for supplies and logistics. So actually that's pretty streamlined inside the ship. The bottleneck is really what you can get through the hangar and how quickly. Now, in the beginning of the Galactic Civil War, the Imperial Navy was a well-oiled fighting machine. You had well-organized sector fleets, distribution centers in each sector. Maybe you couldn't uh, make it back to Quant or Corellia for a full resupply or refit, which takes even longer. But you could go to Fondor in the colonies regions, or Yaga Minor or uh, Bill Bringy shipyards also had docks, not only for Star Destroyers, but even Star Dreadnoughts. The Empire was also known for deploying, like, mobile deep space docks into the in for certain operations. But back then, the Empire didn't really have to worry about guarding their supply lines and logistical centers. I mean, you had the occasional rebel theft, you had the destruction of Psy Moon, which was really like a sign in the beginning of the end for the Empire, because then the rebels really started attacking a lot of these depots and shipyards, and of course, suddenly you had a shortage of locations where you could service an ISD. And this all really started with the Midrunner Offensive, with Twilight Company, as we mentioned uh, earlier. Armed with all of that knowledge from every challenge, Twilight Company was able to punch weight above its weight. They actually ended up carrying out a very daring operation on the Foundry World of Solace and helped liberate the entire planet and all of its industrial capacity, which I'm sure was a lot more damaging than just taking out a single Imperial-class Star Destroyer. Also, the Imperial-class Star Destroyers were powerful, but when they sustained damage, 
damaged, they needed repairs, and that oftentimes could take weeks, if not months, depending on how bad the damage was. You know, this isn't a Gazanti class cruiser where you can just pick up off the shelf parts uh, and repair your ship like that. For instance, the hyperdrive on ISD was only manufactured by KDY and also the size of a cruiser. So you had to go to Quant for some services if you have any damage to it. During the early Imperial era, at most you had maybe one or two Imperial class star destroyers a month that were heavily damaged and needed refitting. But by the height of the Galactic Civil War, the Empire was losing that many Imperial class star destroyers a day. And then you had dozens of Imperial class star destroyers that were getting damaged and the line for the few shipyards that could actually quickly turn these ships around were getting out of hand. You just didn't have enough capacity. It's kind of like when Tesla came to the market back in the day or like uh, some of these new EV uh, companies we're seeing in America, they might create really cool looking vehicles that perform well, but if you have a problem with servicing, you know, it might take a really long time to actually go to a dealer. I mean, they don't have a dealership, but like a service center. Similar problem here. The the Empire was very optimistic about how many Star Destroyers they would have to repair at once. After the Battle of Endor, it became common for Rebel Patrols to run into Imperial Class Star Destroyers that look a lot like the one Thrawn had in the Ahsoka series. You know, missing plating, maybe a shield generator or two. Some had obvious gaps and holes in the hole that could be targeted or even like used as an assault corridor. Others had entire banks of turbolasers destroyed which created giant blind spots that, again, could be easily attacked. I mean, an Imperial class Star Destroyer on a good day was antiquated in its design. Now, imagine the same Star Destroyer with several weak spots in the hull, much less firepower and defenses, and suddenly, the Imperials were running away from the fight against the Rebels. Now, as an Imperial Captain, you might encounter a Rebel Patrol that you can easily defeat, but you also have to think to yourself, if my ship gets damaged at all, how long will it take to replace stuff, you know? And if I lose crew members, how am I going to replace them? That was the problem the Empire really faced in the last few years of the war, and that limited the effectiveness of all of their platforms and weapon systems. On top of that was the manpower issues. When the Death Star was destroyed, a million of the best Imperial personnel went along with it. And with every battleship destroyed, with every mass defection, the number of officers and the quality of crew declined significantly. Especially on the Imperial class Star Destroyer, where you needed a Hoboken's worth of people to just run it properly. I mean, if you follow the career of TIE Fighter Pilot Sienna Ree, uh, by the Battle of Jakku, she had been promoted to captain of an entire Imperial class Star Destroyer, which is kind of crazy. In the early days of of the Empire, the Emperor had basically too many unemployed people and so he enrolled them into the military and created ships that were really dependent on heavy manpower. By 5 BBY, the Empire was running out of cannon fodder and those platforms became a liability. Actually, if you take a look at the First Order's Imperial Class Star Destroyers, they're completely automated. They cut down the crew size by like a uh, like two thirds, I think. And so when we look at the Imperial military, a lot of people might be wowed by how impressive their uniforms look, how big their vessels are, but I only see liabilities. I see a military that can only operate in certain environments and conditions with a massive, massive logistical tail. The Rebel Alliance was already built to fight in any condition. They were used to using the bare minimum to fight back against the Empire. And so they're in some ways far more resilient than their Imperial counterparts. You know, oftentimes when we look at military power, we look at the number of tanks a country has, how many soldiers they have, uh, how high tech their stealth fighters are. But ask yourself, if this sh really hits the fan, you know, let's say the United States has to face a near pure adversary uh, that was able to do significant damage to our logistical network, which really never happened during the global war on terror. How would the U.S. be able to operate in that kind of environment? I mean, how many times can an F-35 fly without spare parts and fuel and munitions? How long can a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier operate after taking a few direct hits from a ballistic missile or a drone swarm? Do you know how long it would take to repair a Nimitz-class? We don't really have the facilities to do this. I think we've... Um, we have some deals with South Korea and Japan now where, where they will help us repair smaller ships, but... Yeah, an aircraft carrier is like a Star Destroyer. They have so many proprietary components on board that are just really hard to replace. You know, when I look at the United States military, I, I, I'm impressed by it, but at the same time, aside from the Marines, who seem to be proud of their lack of resources, a lot of the weapons platforms and, you know, doctrine that the US military applies in combat might not work in a war against a China, or, you know, you see what's happening in Ukraine and Russia, like an attrition war, I don't know how we would fare, and that kind of scares me. Now, sometimes high tech, high power also equals high maintenance and unreasonably complicated logistics. And again, logistics is really the key to a lot of things, not just in the military, but like if you're running a business, if you're just doing basic things in life. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.